This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Monday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance and Magic's highest level of competition. Over the years, I've done several MTG Top 10s on Planeswalkers in general. It is the kind of list I end up updating every couple of years. However, one thing I surprisingly haven't done in the almost 400 MTG Top 10s I've made so far is take a look at Planeswalkers by color. I thought this would be a neat thing to do so that more Planeswalkers get their time to shine in MTG Top 10s than they normally do. So today we're taking a look at mono white Planeswalkers and in the coming weeks and months we'll likely be looking at other Planeswalkers by color. Planeswalkers are of course one of the most powerful card types in the game as they tend to come down and do something on the board immediately and then snowball as the game goes on since they continue to do stuff every turn without you ever having to pay mana for them again. This results in a very high percentage of Planeswalkers at least seeing some play at Magic's highest level of competition. To be eligible for this list, a Planeswalker had to be Mono White. In all, there are 29 Planeswalkers that are Mono White, and if we take away the Planeswalker deck Planeswalkers, who don't really count because they're intentionally designed to not be competitive, there's really only 21 White Planeswalkers, and 14 of them have at least one point using my system, so that shows you just how strong Planeswalkers tend to be on average. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A top 8 at a Pro Tour, Players Tour, Mythic Championship, Mythic Invitational, Legacy, or Vintage Championship is worth 2 points, and a top 8 at a Magic Fester Grand Prix is worth 1 point. Before we get to the list, let me take a moment to tell you about this video's special sponsor, Into the AM. They are an apparel company that sells all kinds of awesome stuff, including graphic tees like the shirt I'm wearing now. Their shirts have really neat designs, like this one. If you know me, you know I like birds, so I was pretty excited to see they had a shirt called Universal Guardian. As you can see, it has an owl on it who is, well, he's guarding the universe, which is pretty awesome. On top of that, this shirt also glows in the dark. In addition to having great designs, their shirts also have a great fit. I'm 6'3 and 260 pounds, and this usually means I need to buy big and tall clothing, but this double XL shirt fits me great. Right now, Into the AM is doing a promotion where you can get three graphic tees for $60. In addition to that, if you use my special link, which you should see on screen and you'll also be able to find in the description, you'll get an additional 10% off. I highly recommend Into the AM, so if you're looking for some cool new shirts, this might be the time to do it. Alright, let's get to the top 10. At number 10, it is Ajani, Caller of the Pride. This Ajani is a 3-mana Planeswalker that has 4 starting loyalty, which is really good. Like most Ajani's, he also buffs your creatures. His plus 1 gives a plus and plus 1 counter to 1 creature, his minus 3 sends a creature into the air and gives it double strike, and his minus 8 can make a bunch of cat tokens. You're not normally going to get to that ultimate, though. Your opponent will either deal with Ajani, or he'll win you the game by buffing your creatures so efficiently. Unsurprisingly, this Ajani was played in standard aggro decks. Perhaps most notably, it was played in Bant Hexproof decks, which were sort of the precursor to Bogle's decks. The deck looked to get a Hexproof creature into play and slap auras on it. Usually, giving one of those creatures flying and double strike with Ajani's minus three was enough to win the game on the spot, and your opponent usually couldn't do anything about it because of Hexproof. Ajani doesn't have any points, though, since 2014, as he isn't played in modern versions of Bogle's. At number 9, it is Gideon of the Trials. This is one of the more unique designs of any white planeswalker in, really, any planeswalker, period. This is mostly the result of his second zero loyalty ability, which gives you an emblem that makes it so you can't lose and your opponent can't win as long as you control a Gideon planeswalker. Because it's a zero ability, Gideon can come down and do that right away, and in the right deck, dealing with Gideon is quite difficult, and it's not like your opponent can remove the emblem. He also has a plus one that makes a permanent not do damage until your next turn, and of course, like all Gideons, he can also turn himself into an indestructible, undamageable creature and enter the fray himself. As you can imagine, this Gideon isn't exactly well suited for aggressive decks like the majority of white planeswalkers, and has mostly been played in control decks, where he can really slow down aggressive opponents with the emblem and the plus one ability. Gideon has found some modest success in multiple formats. In Standard and Modern, he's gained points in Blue-White Control decks. In Pioneer, he appeared in the sideboard of a Sram Auras deck that top aided a Pro Tour, mostly as a card to bring in against decks looking to win the game with Thassa's Oracle. And in Historic, he's gained points in Jeskai Control. Those Historic points came very recently at the Strixhaven Championship, so it seems like Gideon of the Trials has a reasonable shot at adding to its score in the future. 
At number 8, it is Elspeth T. Rell, who has the same total score as Gideon of the Trials, but more pro to her top 8, so I gave her the higher spot on this list for now. This Elspeth really likes it if you have creatures in play, since her plus 2 gains you a life for each of your creatures. She can also populate the board for you with her minus 2, which makes 3 soldier creature tokens, which do an excellent job of protecting her. One of the nastier things you can do with her is play her, use her plus two and protect her for a turn, and then you can fire off her ultimate on the very next turn, and she even sticks around with a single loyalty. And that ultimate has a massive impact on the board since it destroys almost all non-land permanents. She gained all of her points in block and standard, primarily in control and mid-range decks. She was at her nastiest though in more aggressive token decks, who could really take advantage of all of her abilities quite effectively. She hasn't gained any points since 2012 and seems unlikely to gain more in the future. At number 7, it is Gideon Blackblade. The last couple of white planeswalkers we've looked at really excelled in control decks, but with Gideon Blackblade we return to another one that's incredibly well suited for aggro decks. Again, like all Gideons, this one becomes a creature. However, unlike the others, this one does so with a static ability, not a loyalty ability, and that means you don't have to decide between making Gideon into a creature on a turn or using one of his other abilities. In this case, he's just a 4-4 that is indestructible and prevents all damage done to himself as long as it's your turn. This sort of makes him a 3-mana 4-4 with those impressive keywords, which is pretty awesome, especially because he comes with two additional loyalty abilities. His plus one can grant a keyword to another one of your creatures, and you have some great options to choose from, and if you can get his loyalty high enough, he can even exile a non-land permanent. He was played almost exclusively in Mono White and Boros aggro decks while he was in Standard. So far, he hasn't gained any points in any other formats, but he has come close to top eights in both Pioneer and Historic. At number 6, it's another Ajani. This one is Ajani Adversary of Tyrants. In keeping with his usual strengths, this Ajani is quite good in aggro decks. His plus 1 lets you put a counter on two separate creatures, his minus 2 lets you reanimate a small creature, and his ultimate turns out lifelink creature tokens. Unsurprisingly, he was played in a lot of white aggro decks while he was in standard. At number 5, it is yet another Ajani, Ajani Goldmane, one of the original five planeswalkers printed in Lorwyn and thus also the very first Ajani. This is another white planeswalker who is at his best in an aggro deck. His plus 1 gains you 2 life, but the real power of this Ajani comes with that minus 1, which permanently buffs your whole board and gives it vigilance until end of turn. That is enough to turn the game around in a hurry, especially if you get to use that ability more than once. Pumping your whole board and getting Vigilance is great because it really alters a race. Not only do your creatures get bigger, they can also stick around and block, which wouldn't have been possible otherwise. The Avatar token he makes with his ultimate is also pretty cool, since the creature has power and toughness equal to your life total, but you're not going to be using it all that often. He saw playing a lot of aggressive white decks that could go wide while in standard, especially in Kithkin and black-white token decks. He was also featured in Lorwyn Block Constructed Kithkin decks. He doesn't have any points though since 2010. At number 4 it is our third Gideon, Gideon Jura. The 5 through 10 cards on this list were all pretty tightly grouped, but the difference between the number 5 card on the list and the number 4 card on the list, which is Gideon Jura, is pretty massive at 30 points. So from here on, the list really represents the top tier of white planeswalkers. Anyway, Gideon Jura was actually the first time we ever saw Gideon, and he was pretty impressive. He started with a lot of loyalty and could raise it quickly, making it difficult to deal with him. His plus two could force your opponent to attack you, which could be useful if you were trying to win on the backswing, and it also comboed well with his minus two, which let you destroy a tapped creature. And of course, like all Gideons, he can also become an imposing creature all on his own. He was pretty close to a staple in white decks while in standard, but he showed up most often in more mid-rangey decks in both standard and extended, with Cobblade and Delver some of its most frequent homes. It hasn't gained any points since 2012. At number 3 it is Elspeth Knight Errant, which was the first Elspeth Planeswalker card. She comes with a plus 1 that makes a creature token, which does a pretty good job of protecting her, and that's normally what you'll do if you're behind. If you're ahead though, you'll be using the other plus 1, which gives a creature plus 3, plus 3, and flying, and that kind of stats boost and evasion can often enable an attack you just didn't have before. The fact she has two abilities that are plus ones also means that her loyalty never goes down unless your opponent damages her, so it makes getting to her powerful ultimate somewhat possible. She is yet another white planeswalker who is really geared toward more aggressive decks, and she's done it in a whole lot of formats. In standard, she was played in decks like Kithkins, White Weenie, and Black White Tokens. In extended, she was played in Doron and Zoo. In modern, she's gained points in Hate Bear, Banta Aggro, and Zoo as well. She's even played in legacy aggro decks like Maverick in addition to being played in Stoneblade. 
She's still gaining points in Legacy these days and is likely to continue to gain points but it's kind of unlikely she ever catches the top two cards on this list as they both have over 100 points. At number two, it is another Elspeth, Elspeth's son's champion. At six mana, obviously this Elspeth isn't really geared towards aggro decks, but she is super powerful and very much worth that price tag. She has a plus one that gives you three creature tokens, meaning she can come down and do a good job of protecting herself while also raising her loyalty. She has a minus three that kills all the big creatures, which would leave her token friends behind, and she has an ultimate that turns all of your creatures into huge flyers. It is just very hard to deal with Elspeth after she resolves, particularly because of the army of tokens she quickly builds to hide behind. She's largely been featured in mid-range and control decks in all three formats she has points in, which are block, standard, and modern. She's a great win condition in those decks because she can single-handedly help you stabilize, even if you're pretty far behind on board. While she isn't exactly heavily played in Modern, she only has 10 points there since being printed in 2013, she does see pretty consistent play there, putting up a few points every year, usually in Jeskai or Blue-White control decks. Although she doesn't have any points so far in 2021, she's also played in Pioneer but has yet to actually gain points there. Still, it seems likely she'll continue to add to her score in the future, though she'll basically never catch the number one card on this list, which is Gideon, Ally of Zendikar. Gideon was utterly dominant during his time in Standard in a way that very few cards are, and a huge chunk of his 173 points comes from those 144 Standard points. Gideon's ability to churn out 2-2 creatures to protect him while also pressuring your opponent, plus the ability to rumble himself, makes him very nice. He also is interesting in that he has an ultimate you can use the minute you play him, and sure, it isn't a game-breaking one like so many are, but sometimes an anthem for your whole team is what you need. His highlights in Standard came in decks like Abzan, Selesnya Tokens, and Mardu Vehicles. He's picked up top 8s in Modern in decks like Abzan, Junk, and Hatebear. He also sees play in Legacy's Death and Taxes and Miracles. He even sees play in Vintage Landstill decks, where if you can stick Gideon ahead of Standstill, he can just churn out allies, which will eventually make your opponent have to play a spell. He isn't rapidly gaining points these days, but he isn't completely idle either, so I think he'll stay the number one card on this list for the foreseeable future. Well, those are the 10 mono-white planeswalkers that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. If you want to own any of them, check out the description where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for every card that appeared in this video. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it with your friends so they can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future top 10s, you should subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on the almost 400 other MTG top 10s I've already done, you should see a playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching.